to a festival last night with a lot of super songwriters. If I make a phone call this week and I find someone who's willing to volunteer to do Angel Band, can I, can I, okay, I'll let you know as soon as I can. Yeah. All right. That would be the answer. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. Yeah, I would love it. Yeah. Of course, I mean, would you be able to do it? I'd probably do it. Okay, yeah, I'll find some country. Oh, yeah, that's that's yeah. Get some twang in there. That'd be awesome. Yeah. We can support them. We can support them however they Okay. What do you mean? Like, if they're like, yeah, but I need someone to play guitar with me. Or, okay. Yeah, I need someone to play bass with me. Yeah. Like, okay, cool. Piano or something. All right. Or like drum set or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll let them know. Test, test. All right. Everyone can hear now? All right, fantastic. Uh, for those of you who are worshiping with us in person today, please do fill out the little red books that you will find in your rows. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. Let us know a little bit about yourself so that we can uh, greet you um, appropriately. Um, not a lot of to say in a way of announcements, except I, I'm sure all of you all have received a, a letter from me over the last week letting you know that there's some changes going on as I have been uh, called to Central Christian Church in Lexington, uh, Kentucky. And I wanted to begin by telling you all just, uh, just a quick story. About eight years ago, um, I had just finished a couple of really rough weeks where I had had conversations uh, over Skype, this was before the days of Zoom, um, Skype with some churches that I was interviewing with, and they had all just gone absolutely terribly. Uh, a couple of them wouldn't call me back, a couple of them just weren't good fits. I'd called a regional minister uh, who were one of the churches a couple of the churches were and talked to him a little bit about it, and, uh, and he said, you know, Brandon, one of the problems is, is you have a certain type of experience and it doesn't always jive with the local congregation. And we had a little office in our house where I would have uh, these conversations. And there was one that was scheduled for First Christian Church of Chattanooga. And I told my wife, um, this is gonna be about a half hour and I'll be back. It's gonna be the same, it's gonna be the same sort of conversation. Um, I was on that call for about an hour and a half and uh, had a great conversation with folks uh, like Betty Floyd, Byron Cole, Scott Crossland, uh, and it was chaired by Dan Sumlin. 
And um, I came out of that conversation and I looked at Lisa and I said, huh, something's happening. And it has been wonderful that you all have trusted me over the last eight years uh, to be a little bit different from the other kids, quote unquote. Um, a little bit different um, type of minister, and I have appreciated that trust. And uh, I had a, a different feeling a couple of weeks ago as I knew these things were coming together and, and I would be probably leaving. Um, I was in this building by myself, and I just had this sense of excitement for the person who comes next. Because those incredible people that I had that first conversation with, the incredible people that I met after that conversation and the incredible people who have come to this church over the last eight years uh, have inspired and challenged and been the most terrific partners in ministry that I could imagine. And as always, I thank you and I thank God for you. Lana Williams, the president of our congregation, has some things to say about the logistics, about next steps. So from the moment that Reverend Gilvin announced that he was going to be accepting a new call, we began a period of transition. Transitions are always challenging. There are times of uncertainty. But just as we've shared our church history over the past 175 years, that's right, 150. I was thinking, oh. Yeah, 150 for us. We're, we're going to make it to 175, I promise. <laughs> um, but across generations, across ministries, across comings and goings, we have experienced much change. But as we move through the natural phases of these comings and goings, we will still be church. We will still be together as church. So the phases are, first of all, farewell. We started saying goodbyes, and that will continue for the time that, that Brandon's with us. We want to make sure we focus on, on keeping things going in our daily operations, and that uh, as we celebrate the growth and accomplishments we've shared together over eight years, that, uh, that we take time to celebrate that as, as we begin to prepare for our future. And the interim period that follows, uh, we will be maintaining that momentum, and we will be, we'll be reflecting over, uh, over our history and confirming our sense of identity together as a church. We will eventually be celebrating a time of preparation as we welcome a new ministry uh, together with, with someone new whose leadership, as Brandon says, will be a period of excitement and challenge for us in other ways. So uh, just, uh, just so that you know, the process is in, of transition has begun. We are taking steps and we'll be, uh, we'll be searching for an interim minister. We will establish a search committee to, to have those calls like Brandon just shared with new candidates who, who, will, uh, who will hopefully be a really good fit for us. And uh, to, to begin that conversation, uh, the board will be meeting immediately following worship in the Faith Collective. So thank you for uh, your support during this time. And uh, thank you, Brandon, for, for allowing, allowing us to continue to be church as we look forward. And last, I do want to acknowledge that I know that uh, if I'm feeling a mix of things, uh, then I know that you all are as well. And uh, I want to invite you all, if there are things that you need to talk about uh, with me, to give me a call, make an appointment, we'll grab some coffee, we'll, we'll have the conversation that we need to have. And I want to make sure that you all you know, know that it's important that you all feel the things that you need to feel in this period. It's, uh, it is a time of change, and change comes with great joys and great challenges. Um, I am grateful that Reverend Allison Bright will be preaching this morning as we begin this new series, 
Band, um, which we're going to be focusing on young adult novels that have been historically banned in school districts and in libraries and all of that sort of thing. It will be uh, a great opportunity to kind of reflect on context and reflect on the biblical text as well. We are also beginning a slightly different um, order of worship this week. And so acknowledging that and acknowledging that we have a different form and format of our bulletin, uh, which is a little more magazine-like, um, I will be walking us through that as, as we go. So uh, this beginning section, you've heard the welcome and announcements, we'll have the prelude, there will be a call to worship, and then we will sing the first hymn, which if you're like me and you don't really like to fiddle around with uh, a hymnal, the lyrics are printed there. And from there we will go uh, into our joys and concerns after we share, share this first opening hymn um, and the procession, Creator God, uh, Creating Still. But for now, let us open our hearts, open our minds, and listen for that still, small voice that God who calls us to community, that calls us to hope, that calls us to change, and above all calls us to transformation. Good morning, church. Please stand if you're able and join me in the call to worship. Holy One, because we trust you, we will not march back to what was. We are a church and a country that is bruised but whole. For in you there is always light. Let us worship.
come now to the time in our worship service where we bring the joys and concerns of our community together. I will share those with you and then we will respond in song um, with a chorus from Great Is Thy Faithfulness, which you'll see there printed in the bulletin. And then we will pray together uh, and conclude with the Lord's Prayer and then repeat again the chorus from Great Is Thy Faithfulness. There are a number of folks that we want to keep in our hearts as we gather for this time of prayer. We remember uh, Kara Carcion and her family. Kara was a freshman at Saudi Daisy High School who lost her battle with cancer uh, on Thursday. So we keep her family, we keep all of the community, the faculty of Saudi Daisy High School in our prayers as they deal with that loss. We also remember uh, the family of Hope Petrie, uh, Fran, his sons David and Matthew, and his daughter Karen. Um, Hope died this last week, and we will be celebrating Hope's life here on July 15th. And uh, the family are going to welcome friends for visitation at 1, and then we will celebrate his life here in the sanctuary uh, at 2. Uh, Don Reynolds had a fall um, last week and is doing okay after that. Um, we also uh, keep our prayers with Dick and Carol Sharp as Dick is being transferred to a memory facility um, after dealing with a number of complications due to dementia over the last several months. And we are also praying um, with the Wileys as Charlie Wiley broke his arm while on vacation and there's really nothing like breaking your arm uh, in the middle of summer when you want to be throwing a baseball. and. Um, but I hear he gets ice cream out of the deal or something like that. Um, as we prepare for 4th of July, we also remember the seismic shifts in our society. Uh, big questions over this last week over religious accommodation, uh, service and free speech, uh, affirmative action. And we know that the American experiment is not complete. It's not over. And we pray with those who have historically been left out, those who remain um, as though they have been left out. And we pray as a congregation as well for hope in the midst of uncertainty. Uh, we pray for our own hearts as we are full of anxiousness and anticipation. And we pray for the ability to see what lies ahead, even if it is now a little cloudy. Let's join our voices as we sing the chorus of Great is Thy Faithfulness, number 86. You'll also find it in your bulletin. God who transcends our belief, you who are a beautiful mystery unbound by our words, never quite captured by our thoughts, sometimes silent in the midst of our prayers, we bring our very hearts to you. We come feeling the wounds left by the lives we live, the wounds that we experience as a shared body the wounds often self-inflicted that we feel as a nation, the wounds of our world. We come, O oh God, seeking your hope like a child awaiting your voice. God who comes to us in moments of disbelief and unbelief, come to us when we are wounded. Be our friend. Be the physician you have promised to be, the shepherd who seeks out the lost ones. Be with those among us who worry about illness, who worry about being unequal under the law, about being denied opportunity, about being forgotten, about being abandoned. 
Find us, holy God, wherever we are, and remind us that we need to feel the things we feel. We need to know and name them. Give us words. Give us courage. Give us love. God, who believes in us, we keep seeking you out, asking if you are there, if you are with us, if you are indeed our friend, and we know. Deep down, you have told us you are. So fill us with wisdom and compassion. Quell the heat of our anxiousness and remind us who we are, part of your creation, your disciples, and your children, the ones you have called just like those first disciples were called. And so teach us to pray just as Christ taught those first disciples to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. you will notice that we have modified worship a little bit, and because you are so good at these sung response and refrains, we have added one after scripture. So we will conclude scripture reading with our normal response, and then we will sing thy word one time through. But before we get to the scripture, some context. Now, sometimes the portion of scripture that we tell you the context of is lengthier than the actual text itself. But today is not that way. It's much simpler and much shorter. This 13th Psalm is one of lament. Like many of the Psalms, its words can feel more personal because they're honest and emotive. Now, the Psalms are unique from most of our other sacred words because they are told predominantly from the first person point of view, which means their words feel like our words. And perhaps the reason we are drawn to the Psalms when we don't know where else to turn is because they don't instruct, they don't speak in puzzles or parables. And they don't have very many characters. It's typically just you and God. They invite us to know God through our emotions and shared experiences. So church, take a deep breath. Let your walls down just a little bit. And entrust the spirit with your care as we hear these words from the 13th Psalm. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I be left to my own wits, agony filling my heart? Daily? How long will my enemy keep defeating me? Look at me. Answer me, Lord my God. Restore sight to my eyes. Otherwise, I will sleep the sleep of death, and my enemies will say, I have won. 
My foes will rejoice over my downfall. But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. Yes, I will sing to the Lord, because God has been good to me. This is the good news. In light of last week's news that Reverend Brandon has accepted his next call, it's really important for me that you know that we pre-planned this series, this scripture, and its title months ago. And yet as we sit here today, it all seems ordained by God, or at least led by the Holy Spirit. If you keep up with our internet presence, or you read those emails we send you, or you just pay attention to the announcements on Sunday morning, first of all, pat yourself on the back. (laughs) But second of all, it's no surprise to you that we're kicking off a new series called Band. In church, when we were planning this series, I have never seen Brandon's eyes twinkle quite so much, specifically when he looked at me and said, We have so much reading to do. (laughs) Boy, did we. Today's banned book is called, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. You probably know this title. It's written by Judy Bloom, and it was first published in 1970. And since it was first published, it has been heavily banned all across the US for 50 years and counting. The story features an 11-year-old girl named Margaret. And like many 12 and 11-year-olds, Margaret is starting to see the world in new ways. As is developmentally appropriate, she can now empathize and connect with people beyond those just in her household. At this age, even today, people start to look around and notice the ways that they are different and that makes them wonder where they belong. Margaret in this story has two major challenges. The first one is that she is very ready to get her period. And the second is she wants to know what religion she should be. She was raised in a non-religious household. Her mother was raised Christian, her father was raised Jewish, and didn't want to put religion on her. And so at 12 years old, she's trying to figure out if she should be Christian and join the YMCA or be Jewish and join the Jewish Community Center. But what stands out most to me in this book is her, in her self-exploration is the level of honesty she expresses in her prayers. Every single, single prayer in every chapter of this book, she starts with, Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I admire her ongoing honesty because she admits that, A, she's not entirely sure if God is real, although I would say people don't talk to a God that they don't believe in. But also, she's not sure if God is listening. But she prays fervently anyway. Here are some excerpts from her prayers. We're moving today, God, and I'm so scared. God, I just want you to be proud of me. I've never been inside a temple or a church before. I'll look for you, God. And then later, well, I've been to church and I didn't feel anything special in there, God. Even though I wanted to. I'm sure it has nothing to do with you, God. Next time, I'll try harder. 
And later she says, I still don't really fear, feel you, God, and I'm more confused than ever. My friend Gretchen got her period first out of all our friends, and I'm so jealous, God. I hate myself for being jealous, but I am. I just want to be normal, God. Can you make me normal? And nearing the end, she says, I'm so miserable. Everything is wrong. Margaret is very much like our psalm writer today. The psalmist starts with, how long will you forget me, God? Forever? They continue to express deep anguish and agony, which they are fearful may never end. This text this week had me wondering how many of you said your own honest prayers of anger and lament this week. I know that the first time I heard Brandon's news, I certainly prayed a prayer very similar to this. Only mine sounded like, how long do we have with Brandon, oh God? How many days? How many more sushi dates? Maybe your prayer was a little angrier. How dare he, oh God, and how dare you? How could he? Why would you do this, God? Things are so good right now. Maybe your prayers were more benign. Holy one, I'm just not ready, and I'm really doubting your timing in all of this. God, I don't understand. Where are you in the midst of this good news? Maybe you focused your anger on the next community, right? Maybe you said, God of love, it's so good that you're looking out for them, but what about us? Or maybe you prayed like Margaret. Are you there, God? It's hard to see you today. Whatever your bold and honest prayer is, today and yesterday and in all the ones to come, it is my hope and prayer that we will be curious about the emotions driving our prayers and that we will be brave enough to ask what they're really telling us. I heard from a good many of you this week, like probably more than I've ever heard from you in any other week. And I noticed a lot of anger. And I would caution you with anger because righteous anger can promote justice-oriented change. But anger that is based out of fear or anxiety can be awfully destructive. After all, the heart of what people want to do when they ban books is fear-based anger. Banning books is about control or lack thereof. It's based out of this, and it's something you didn't expect and you couldn't control, and that creates anger. Now hear me say, I'm not going to tell you not to feel anger. You can't help how you feel. And all of your emotions are valid. But I am going to push you a little bit more. Because you see, church, anger is usually a secondary emotion. It's big and it's powerful and it's much easier to name. But oftentimes we say, I'm angry at you because it's easier than saying, you hurt me. Ang 
anger is an important emotion in the grieving process, but it shouldn't be the driving force. So whether you're angry, or you're sad, or you're still in shock, or you're all of those things depending on the hour, let the psalmist's words of lament speak today to why we are here and how we are feeling. When hard and confusing things happen, we ask if God is really there, much like Margaret, even more so like the psalmist. And today I'd like to tell you a personal story of my own experience of pastors accepting a new call. And it's not about the one in this room. When I was freshly 16, my youth minister from my home congregation left our church. She was the only youth minister I really remember. And she had a way of wrestling her way into my heart. And I didn't let too many people see that. And when she did, she helped me see that even though I excelled in sports and academics, even though I had close friends, that I was miserable. And even more so than miserable, I was actually really depressed. And she was the first person who destigmatized therapy and mental health medication for me, which literally saved my life. So when she left our church, I was caught off guard. My world was rocked. This person I loved and trusted and that saw the parts of me I didn't want seen wasn't there anymore. And so I tried to fill that void by getting to know our other pastors on staff, a senior and associate who were married. And suddenly they became those people. I text them about the nuances of being 16, stupid things that my friends did, bad choices they made, how I could love them anyway. And the really important things, like should I take advanced literature or communication? <laughs> and they reminded me that whatever I took, it was gonna be all right. God could handle that. And then eight months later, they left the church. And I felt abandoned. And at first, these departures didn't make me feel isolated because my whole community was grieving alongside me. We were planning farewells and saying thank you, and then putting together search and call paperwork and saying, oh, these candidates, can you believe this? Until we found one, that was okay. Just okay, though. I have higher hopes for us. All this to say, I looked around and one day, My community wasn't grieving anymore, but I still was. And so I reached out to another member at the church. Her name is Carrie Harland. She was one of our youth mentors, and I knew her well. And I asked her if we could go to coffee. I don't drink coffee. I certainly didn't at 16, but that's not really why you go to coffee, right? So we sat in McDonald's at 10 a.m. on a cold September morning because McDonald's was the only place that served consumable coffee in Macon County. And I sipped a hot chocolate as she drank the largest cup of coffee I have ever seen. 
Our conversation eventually shifted to church and transitions and the changes happening there. And then we got really quiet. Crocodile tears welled up in my eyes despite my best attempt to stop them. After all, I'm 16 and a grown-up now. And after some silence, I looked up at Carrie and saw tears streaming down her angular face. And in a near whisper, I said, when will their leaving stop hurting so much? When will their leaving stop hurting so much? As tears streamed down her high cheekbones, she said, I don't know, but I'll let you know when I get there. Church, I'm not arrogant enough to pretend that I know how all of you are feeling, let alone any one of you. But I am confident that God is still here through the tear-soaked faces of our friends. I'm confident that God is still walking alongside us in our anger, in our sadness, and in our shock, and most of all, in our hope. For some of you, it might feel like you are sitting in the ashes of your hopes today. For others, this might not be all that life-altering. But wherever you are, emotionally and spiritually, I hope that you find the bravery to tell God about it with words that are as raw and honest as Margaret and the psalmist. Because God can handle it. And because God cares about what hurts. As we move towards this next phase of transitions that we didn't expect, trust that God has not abandoned you. God has not abandoned us. God has not abandoned the person you share a pew with. God is with us in the shared tears of a friend's place, of a friend's face. God is with us in the planning of what comes next. God is with us in the long goodbyes. God is with us. God is with you. God is with me. God is with Reverend Branda and Lisa, with the good people of First Christian in Lexington, and with the very good people of First Christian Chattanooga. Like the psalmist, we can move from lament, despair, and anger into words of praise but I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. Yes, I will sing to the Lord because God has been good to me. My final thought for you today is that Margaret begins all of her prayers with, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. until the very last prayer that she prays. After Margaret has gained the thing that she longs for and after she has gained more wisdom about her faith, she shifts her final words and final prayer to this. Are you still there, God? It's me, Margaret. I know you're there. God, I know you wouldn't have missed this for anything. May it be so. May it be so for us today and all the days to come. Amen.
children find the rest How long till you draw them to your breast Oh, go on holding to your promises How long till you wipe away the sky do we wait in vain Jesus give us hope again how long till your words will still the storm how long till you bear snatch us from the thrones how long till you wipe away the tears from every eye till we see our home descending from the sky As we gather around the table, you may notice on the back of the bulletin that after the elders' second prayer that we will again respond as a community uh, in song before we shift to the invitation to community. So let us gather around the table. The peace of Christ be with you. Church, this is the place we come each and every time we gather. We come here whether we've had the best day and we need someone to celebrate with, or as the kids discuss today in Sunday school, on the days you've had a horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day. <laughs> and everything in between. No matter who you are, how you are feeling, or where you come from, there is a place for you here. Bring all that you can. Leave what you must. And take a piece of grace with you. Join me, joining our voices in the communion litany. And the table will be wide. And the will be wide. And the arms will open wide to gather us in. And our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust that there is enough. And we will come unhindered and free. And our aching will be met with bread. And our sorrow will be met with wine.
I'm not quite old enough to have been in that upper room, but I imagine there were a lot of feelings that day. Joy, excitement, sorrow. It's much like how we gather. But we gather to remember the night that Jesus was in an upper room with his closest friends. He took a piece of bread and after giving thanks for it, he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Likewise, after the supper, he took a cup. And after giving thanks for it, he shared it with those in the room and said, each time that you gather, do so in remembrance of me. This is the cup of the new covenant. Holy God, we give you thanks for this bread and wine. We take these emblems in remembrance of your Holy Son who gave his life for each of us. Forgive us when we fail to care for each other and this beautiful earth you have given. And finally, make us peacemakers with all your children. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. In a moment, a deacon or elder will invite you forward. We take communion by intinction here, which is a $10 church word that means we rip and dip and take a bite. So you'll take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and then hopefully pop it in your mouth before it hits the floor. If you need gluten-free or pre-packaged options, those are available as well. If you cannot or do not feel like coming forward, you may also be served in your pew. Just let the person who dismisses your row know that you'd like to be served. One last thing, the, the wine is really just juice, okay? Now that we have all the important information, Know that this table has been set especially for you. No matter who you are, what you have done, or what has been done to you, come to the feast. If you don't build it, you labor in vain. Without your spirit, we stand with no strength. I know my time is passing away. And the works of your hand, what will remain? Let the favor of the Lord rest upon us, O oh Lord. Establish the world. Just to number the length of our days. Pour out your power, or pour out your praise. Teach us to run, to finish the race.
Holy Father, we come as children seeking you because you alone have the words of life. You have promised, Lord, never to leave nor forsake us, so we turn to you now praising you for all you have done for us. In Jesus Christ, you fulfilled these promises, embodied in humanity and imbued with divinity, Christ entered into our suffering and our joy. And so at this table, we find the wholeness we seek in you. In this communion, Lord, as we leave this place, recreate us in your image until all of our treasured and coveted identities are lost, crucified in you so that we can sing rejoicing higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea. Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self, none of self, none of self, and all of thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Church, if this is a place you would like to know more about, if you'd like to figure out what we mean when we say all means you, I encourage you to have a conversation with myself or Reverend Brandon or any of our elders whom you can identify because they have on not one but two name tags. <laughs> Join me now in singing our closing hymn, Abide With Me.
call to worship and benedictions are crafted and molded using the words of Amanda Gorman from her inaugural poem, The Hills We Climb. Your benediction today comes from that as well. Let the church say, if nothing else, that this is true, that even when we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried. Go in peace. Yes,